Cheers. Ever since I moved to Upper East Side in 2020, I was put on to this um, sweet red South African wine. And it's the shit. It's the go-to. I actually abandoned my, um, my, um, I almost forgot the name of it, <laughs> Pinot Grigio. <laughs> I still sip Pinot Grigio from time to time, but it's not my go-to. This is definitely it here. Cause I had, I had been put on to Pinot Gris when I first moved to New York back in 2014. I was dating uh, a former New York Times writer and I wasn't really into drinking wine, but he put me on and I like the taste, I like the bitter taste of Pinot Gris. And since I had been drinking Pinot Gris, or shall I say sipping? And then, like, I moved to Upper East Side and I wanted to switch it up because Pinot Gris was the thing. And so I ended up switching it up. I, I went to um, the wine store near where I live and I asked them what type of red wine would they recommend that's sweet. And he pointed to the South African. I'm just like, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So I love it. I love it. Um,. So in this video, this is going to be a casual, laid-back video, as all of my videos are unapologetic, right? Just me freestyling, unfiltered, uncensored. That's just me. Um, I find it interesting, though, when people comment my videos or they send me messages, like, trying to say, oh, don't worry about what other people think. I mean, what is it? Do I give off the impression that I care about what naysayers think? Absolutely no. I've never given a damn. It should be very clear that I do me and I'm going to do me regardless, right? This platform that I've built, I take pride in being able to come to you guys and create videos on an array of topics of my choosing, some of topics you guys recommend, um, but I've created this space so that I can be myself unapologetically. So don't get it mistaken. Don't ever get it mistaken, right? And don't be concerned about me using my voice and being who I am because that's just who I'm going to be. It's not going to change. I'm 39 years old, so that should be very clear. Uh, and I also get messages, like a ton of messages from people who, and this is just repeatedly, like y'all somehow assume that because I talk to you guys about cuckolding, right? And I'm open to talking about a variety of different things that you think that I am involved in that lifestyle and I'm not. Hey, yo, this freaking wine. I just took a few sips here on camera, as you guys can see, and I'm like already feeling it, yo. I have a very low tolerance. That's the thing for me about me. I have very low tolerance when it comes to alcohol, but damn, this shit, I'm feeling it, yo. Ugh. Mm, 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 mm. I do need to get some more wine glasses. I uh, seem to break them easily. I'm so heavy handed. So, like, when I put them in a sink or if I'm, like, washing dishes, like, they just shatter. I'm like, what the fuck, yo? <laughs> I've shattered, like, eight wine glasses. I've got two sets of them that I purchased, two separate occasions, and I broke all of them. It's crazy. But, yeah, y'all somehow think that just because I, like, come to you guys and I talk about these um, taboo topics that somehow I want to date a cook hole or you know i want to be with beta men it's like absolutely no i mean i made like several videos addressing directly i made videos directly addressing these beta male cook hole men like i'm not interested at all 
but they be propositioning me and like, oh, would you do this? Would you consider? Absolutely no. I'm so tired of answering that question to the point where I'm not going to necessarily answer that question in a separate video, but I will plug that here. Like, no, if you're watching this and you guys have messaged me, which I've received an innumerable amount of freaking messages from different people, specifically beta males, asking me about that. And I'm like, mm -mm. it's not my thing. Like, it's like you like what you like. Either you like what you like or, you, you know, you don't like it. And it's just like you can't make somebody be appealing to something that is just not appealing to them. It doesn't appeal to me. Um, no, not what, not one bit, right? Like I've already mentioned in many of my videos, I identify myself as a submissive baby girl. I want to talk about that a little bit here in this video, but before we get started, I think I'm going to turn on this AC because I already kind of feel like the heat. I feel myself getting warm. Um, so yeah, I want to talk a little bit about like channeling, um, this inner child within, and we all have an inner child. Looking at this through a psychological Freudian lens, even an Ericksonian lens, right? Erickson, he was a developmental psychologist who created these stages of development that he says human beings go through, similar to Freud, um, through Erickson stages, I think it was, what, six? It's a six or eight. And then Freud had uh, five different stages that we go through. But essentially, um, you know, he's they both kind of made the claim that we go through these stages, but somehow if we become stagnant, right, or if there is something that disrupts our development as a child, adolescent, growing up, then we don't successfully achieve the status for that, which that, that stage, you know, is, is set, right? So we may become uh, stagnant or fixated at a particular developmental stage. And I think oftentimes people in looking at BDSM and trying to understand like the psychological underpinnings of BDSM, they sometimes get it right, right? But sometimes they misinterpret some things. Um, they make assumptions and I know this because as a submissive, right? Um, as a baby girl, like people automatically assume certain things, right? And then you have to kind of dispel those assumptions and those myths that people hold, you know, they don't know, right? So I think, yes, it could be true. And it is true for some people that people take to the lifestyle BDSM, for example, being a, a baby girl or submissive, you know, because they're craving the attention, they're craving the love of the father they never had, right? But that's not my case. I, I grew up with the father. I grew up with the mother. I was raised in a two-parent household. My mom, my dad were both active in my um, childhood, my adolescent, you know, just still, even to this day, uh, my young adult and adult life, they've both been active. They've been present. Um, so I wouldn't say that necessarily applies to me. And even the idea that for adults who haven't successfully achieved a certain developmental stage um, within that paradigm of uh, developmental psychology relating to Erickson's stages of development and Freud's stages of development, um, they would like to say that people who haven't achieved certain um, certain uh, stages, right, successfully, that they are stagnant, right, or they are fixated at a certain stage so that, you know, let's say if, for example, within uh, Freudian psychology, uh, a person hasn't successfully met or achieved the oral phase, right? Like they become fixated in that stage of development. And you can see this in their adult life, right? And they oftentimes link that 
failure to achieve that that uh, stage successfully to um, addictions, right, relating to the mouth, right? So it could be food, it can be smoking, for example. Um, and I think that can hold some weight, but it doesn't necessarily apply, right? One may say, okay, if a person hasn't achieved the identity stage successfully within the, the Erickson's um, stages of development that, you know, in their adult life, in their adulthood, like they become, like you can see this manifest in their adult life where, you know, they still are trying to search and find who they are, or they're still kind of in that adolescent phase of, of discovering, you know, themselves. And I'm like, yeah, that could be true. But I think that the issue when trying to kind of conceptualize human behavior through, these different lenses is that people assume that this can apply to everyone. This applies to every situation, which isn't necessarily true, right? So this is the whole art, I think, of philosophy, right? Like we have these theories that we can look through and understand human behavior, but it doesn't mean that one size necessarily fits all. So I have to kind of lay that foundation there. Now, if the shoe fits, of course, I'm gonna wear it. And I've spoken to that before in my previous videos relating to just my experience growing up as a, a child and an adolescent, even though I had both mother and father present in my life, you know, I endured some adverse childhood experiences that, of course, that without a doubt shaped the person I am today, right? Um, so I want to talk about that, like this channeling of this inner child what this inner child looks like, right? And what experiences that help to create this inner child and how this inner child manifests itself in adulthood, right? Um, and I'm speaking from personal experience. Like, I can say this, that for me, because um, it's funny, I had this debate with my professor when I was um, working towards my doctoral degree. I took um, psychodynamic uh, psychology, right? Looking at the psychoanalytic aspect of understanding human behavior. And I remember we had this debate in my class where, of course, through that lens, you know, they attribute pretty much all of, or much of human behavior, especially understanding the the um, adult human behavior. They look at it through this dynamic lens to link everything back to childhood, right? And of course you guys will see that I do that a lot. Obviously that is my school of thought. That's my frame, a general frame of reference, right? But they link it back to childhood right so i got into this like debate with my professor to say that i don't think everything is attributable to childhood you can attribute a lot of things to childhood but some things it's just who that person is innately right or it can just be their archetype you know it can just be like who they were designed to be irrespective of what did or didn't happen in their childhood, right? And it also could be the complete opposite because there's like this deficit uh, perspective in that they would like to assume that for adults, what you see, if there are uh, issues that are pr like present themselves in adulthood, then apparently there was a deficit in childhood right and so i'm thinking of myself as i'm sitting in my uh psychodynamic class with my professor and he's teaching these theories i'm like i didn't have a lot right i wasn't lacking in that area right and, and looking at why am i why have i become like why am i this woman that craves like the 
dominance of a man, right? Why, why do I like that? Like, why is that something that I, I need and I'm attracted to? I'm not attracted to beta men. I like alpha men. That's a constant in my life, right? And like that has not changed, is not going to change, right? Um, it may be, it may come as a surprise to a lot of you guys because you're like, wait a minute, you talk with such certainty, right? And you assert yourself very well to the extent where it seems like you're a very alpha female, right? And I, I talk about like black people, both men and women inherently being naturally dominant. But when it comes to the dynamic between myself as a woman and a man, yes, I prefer the submissive role. And that just comes for me naturally. And I like, I like dominant energy of a man. And so I'm speaking to that in my class of course, this is many years ago. And I'm like, yes, I like that. And I don't think that it, it comes um, as a result of me having a, a lack or a deficit in my life. Because my father was dominant. I say, in fact, I think that I am this way and I crave this dominant energy because my dad displayed that. And I think sometimes just as, as adults, we crave those things that we did have in childhood, not coming from a deficit perspective, theoretical perspective, but we crave those things that we had and that we 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 clung to, that you know that that worked for us, that nourished us. We kind of expect that same type of energy, right? That same type of 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 uh, model that we've internalized in our childhood, you know, that's what we resonate more so with in our adulthood. I was explaining that to him, right? It's just like, this is our, this is our experience. It becomes our worldview in our childhood, right? It becomes this internal working model for what love looks like, right? Or what relationship dynamics should look like between a man and a woman. And I've seen that with my mother and my father. My dad definitely was dominant. I mean, just to kind of set the stage, my dad is 12 years older than my mom. They're both still living, by the way, right? Um, and so that should be clear enough right there, looking at the age differential, right? That creates a power dynamic. My mother is very short. Like I'm taller than my mom. I'm like five foot eight, but my mom is like, she's short. She's, I don't know. Is she even five foot two? My mom is short. My dad is over six foot tall. All right. Another clear distinction, right? Like kind of pointing to that, that differential uh, power dynamic that exists between my mom and my father and just seeing like how they relate to each other like it's clear so my mom of course she's very like headstrong you know she is dominant in her own right but my dad definitely of course was a person wearing a pants in that relationship they sometimes did bump heads though so, like, yes, I, I crave that. And then even in the way my dad related to me as my father, me being his daughter, you know, like, he treated me as a baby girl. I, you know, and even through my adult years, like, I just still had that same kind of baby girl energy around my father, you know, and it's almost like indescribable because it's just like, it's this warm, fuzzy feeling inside that I get, even still to this day, I'm 39 years old. My dad is 81 years old. And, um, wait, is my dad 81? I'm like, I'm a little tipsy right now. <laughs> um, yeah, my dad is 81 years old. He turned 81 in August and I'll be 40. Um, this year, my dad will be 82. That's right. So, because he had me when he was 42 years old. So, 
So it's like, even still to this day, like my dad, he has that effect on me. He's up in age, but it's just like, I get like, I become a different person. It's almost like, you know, of course, with my profession, I'm a clinical psychologist. So that requires for me to obviously have a, a dominant role, you know, in my line of work. And that comes with a certain demeanor, it comes with a certain tone of voice, certain posture, right? Um, but I realized, like, I shift, you know, when I speak to my father. It's just, you know, obviously a matter of reverence for him. But also, it's just like, I become this baby girl in my voice. You, know, you clearly see, like, there's a distinction in, like, my tone of voice when I'm speaking to my father. I'm just like, daddy. <laughs> you know, and he still kind of calls me, like, these little nicknames that he gives me, like, baby girl, sweetheart, you know, honey, and all of this. And it's just, yeah, it's, it's very sweet. And so it's just like... I, I definitely crave that in a male partner um, because my dad gives me that and just makes me feel good, right? So it's not that, okay, there is a lack because even till this day, right, my dad still shows up in that way for me, right? It's just something that I want to continue. And there is a saying that goes that women, we kind of are attracted to men who resemble our fathers, you know? So I think it speaks more towards that than the other theory the deficit theory that I, I explained earlier relating to Freud and, and most traditional psychoanalysts um, definitely wasn't a lack in terms of dominant energy present in the household um, or in, even in my life and so in terms of like channeling this like I would say, yes, it's submissive energy, right? Or this is child, uh, this childlike energy. And of course, I should have maybe prefaced this video, but my video obviously is for adults. Um, you know, only adults really watch my videos according to YouTube analytics. Um, but all my videos, you know, are not child friendly. They're only for adults. Um, but I know I use certain terminology that for people who aren't, you know, they're not well-versed in this lifestyle, they're not really exposed to it, they're like, wait, what? So I may say baby girl, you know, or daddy dom, and I have to be careful even using that language in my titles because YouTube clearly doesn't understand what that means. <laughs> you know, they start to think the complete opposite of really what it is, um, thinking in terms of some pedophilia type shit that's definitely obviously not <laughs> the game here that's not the game plan here um so i think it's worth pointing that out and making distinction because i am going to talk about that a little bit more here in the remaining of many part of this video um so for the longest as far as I can remember, I have always kind of possessed like this baby girl type energy. And, and looking at this through the context of BDSM, there are different levels to baby girl, right? There are submissives, which could be a male or, or, or a woman, right? But um, speaking more to the traditional type of submissive, it, you know, would be a woman. Uh, there are women who, women submissives, a woman, baby girl, who identify more with um, the, a, a little baby girl, like, like five years old, seven years old, you know, and then it, it ranges, right, in terms of how she presents cognitively speaking, um, behaviorally speaking, in her relationship dynamics with, you know, her, her daddy Dom, right? For me, I wouldn't say is that young, but I think it can vary though. And I think depending on my partner, the daddy Dom involved, you know, I could show up as 
a seven-year-old. I can show up as a nine-year-old, like cognitively and behaviorally speaking. I can show up as a 12, right, 15-year-old. For me, I think um, thinking about like my past relationships, I would say I was more so probably about 12, 12, 13, 14, around that age range in terms of my behavioral presentation. Now, this is where it does get tricky, right? Because this is like a real, one would say alter, right? But this is like a real person that I am that's inside of me, right? And, you know, I titled this video channeling that inner child um because the inner that inner child isn't always there or readily present i would say right or visible you know in my interpersonal relationships but it comes out and it comes out at the appropriate time i think you know, as the saying goes, when a, a teacher shows up or the student shows up, the, t the teacher will be there, right? The teacher will be present, um, but the student has to show up first. For me, I think it's the other way around. It's like when the proper alpha daddy dom shows up, then the baby girl will show up, right? That's how it works. And I think it, for me, it's that creating a sense of safety. Um, obviously, understanding has to be there's like the basic principles in nurturing a secure relationship that are present in any vanilla relationship. Those basic principles obviously have to be there first and foremost. But then there are certain nuances that are layered upon those principles um, in the context of a, a DS relationship, dominant submissive relationship. And I think it takes like a, a well-versed, obviously um, well-attuned dominant man to be able to, um, to stand in that role, right? Not any man can do that you know hence I, I would say that the reason why I'm still single because you know it definitely takes a special kind of man that turns me on that's just that's just facts that's just what it is um but it's like the, it's interesting when it happens though I just think it's just it's very amazing the way that this happens and the way that I would say this altar kind of shows up um, because I do become a different person, so to speak, but that inner child is there all along, but the inner child comes out and it feels so comforting when it's nurtured. You know, I think uh, like every woman has this, this inner child living with it we're living within like every woman i think has it you know um i think we because like in our society like we're socialized and and you know there's expectation that you know we're we should present a certain way you know of, and there's this kind of understanding of what a woman is how a woman should be right all these shoulds right a woman should you know wash dishes for example a woman should cook a woman should stay at home and take care of the children a woman should do this a woman should do that right and i think sometimes that uh conflicts with who women really are on the inside and the needs that are there that need to be nurtured like it coincides with that and I don't think that it serves for the best interest of that woman. I mean, obviously, if her needs are not being met, then how could the relationship itself be sufficient, right? Like, 
And I think this is the issue. This is definitely the issue. But for me, I make it no secret, you know, who I am. I make it no secret, like, what my preference is, you know. And I know, me knowing who I am, first and foremost, uh, I think that's very important because when it comes to dating, it's just like, I already know who I am. So, I, of course, I know what kind of man that I like that works for me, that I'm compatible with, you know. So, when I receive, like, emails from beta male men, <laughs> couple men, like, it, like, <laughs> it's almost like two different species, like, incompatible species, just like, why you know like it's it's very repulsive to me and it's not to say that i'm being judgmental or i have a thing against cuckold men i interact with cuckold men all the time but it's just like that's not my cup of tea i have no interest in dating a cuckold man i have no interest in dating a beta man i have no interest in someone sent me an email recently would you own slaves like would you no right? Or servant. Like, it's not my thing. It's just not, right? I have absolutely zero interest in it. If, it'd, be a, it'd be a different story, like, if I actually had an interest or a, a smidget of an interest in these things, right? In terms of, like, a personal interest in it or uh, for myself. But no, I don't. Um... And I think like you guys are trying to persuade me or you're projecting your own personal interest onto me. I get it, you know. Um, and it's okay. Like if you are interested in that and, and that's your cup of tea, that's what you like, then cool. I, I do understand though that because, you know, these alternative relationship types are so rare, right? Like they represent a minority group. Um, a minority interest, then it could be difficult. I mean, I get it. Like me of all people, I definitely understand because I'm in that same boat, you know, when it comes to my own interest in BDSM, specifically being a, a baby girl and being attracted to the daddy dom type. So I definitely understand, but I wouldn't try to persuade or you know, project my interest onto someone else and try to convince them, like, hey, you should try this. It's just like, that's not their cup of tea, you know? And I don't, for me, like, sexuality is something that's sacred. So I'm not here to be just test tasting different types of sexual activities in that way if I know I'm not interested in that, right? Like, that's not my place. So I just have to, like, keep reiterating that because... I am like constantly inundated with these emails, these random emails from people who, you know, watch my videos and they somehow, I'm like, where do you get that from? I mean, clearly, you, like, this is in your own head, like you're making this up, but they somehow have this idea that, oh, <laughs> it would be a great idea. Like if she was a dom or if she was a, a slave, a master, a slave owner and, and she dated a cuckold, like, mm-mm, not my thing. Um, I actually had a master, a real master, and this was the person who kind of introduced me to BDSM. Like, I had been researching BDSM. I had been imagining myself. I had been exploring it. My, my fantasies was in my mind what it's like, but... <laughs> to come across someone who, damn, was like the perfect person, right? In theory, this was like the perfect person. This was back in Atlanta. Um, but he definitely knew. You know, it's like real masters, they know without having to learn, right? Because they, they know themselves, right? They have much experience and and interacting with and being with submissives, you know, they're not new at this. They're not naive to it by any sense of the word. So, um, 
I had, I was fortunate enough to experience that. And if you guys go to my website at daniellelish.com, you'll see that <laughs> this person, <coughs> this master, that's the strongest instance, but this master that I had, um, taught me a lot, right? And he was the one who inspired me to begin to journal, you know, my experiences that we share, which later became a book, right? I haven't published it yet, but I have released excerpts um, from the book on my website at daniellelish.com. Um, and the things that I learned from him, sometimes I pull from those lessons and I share them with you guys. I share them in terms of, you know, the nuances of it and what I learned. And one of the biggest lessons was that he was patient. Like when it comes to certain types of alternative stigmatized sexual activities, like one has to be patient. And I understand that a lot of y'all, y'all come off as so desperate. You come off as very anxious. For me, that's a complete turnoff. Like he was so calculated. He was so confident in who he is. And knowing that there was no need to pressure. But though he would test limits. And I appreciate that about him being a, a, a true master. A daddy dom. Because he would test limits. But he was very calculated. He was very patient. And he was very attentive. Like he took our relationship very seriously. He took it. Like he took our relationship. Like as it was a job. It was work. When I say work, like the same amount of attention to detail, like attentiveness, right? And seriousness that you devote to your business, right? Or your job. He took it very seriously. I think that's the issue with some people involved, you know, in this, these types of alternative uh, relationship dynamics is that you know, they don't really, they're not serious, you know, they, they're anxious, they're desperate, and they kind of rush into things, um, being sex driven, you know, that to me is a turn off as well. Um, but they're not really taking time to themselves. That to me is a, a complete turn off. I often reference that particular relationship because it definitely was my awakening. It was my stepping into this lifestyle of BDSM. And I'm glad that I had a great first time experience. And as you guys pay attention, we'll note that me and my master, we never had penetrable sex. We never had sex at all. If anything, yes, of course it was a, a sexual exchange in our minds, right? In, in our interactions with each other, but we never, we never had sex. Because it wasn't about the sex, right? It was about the domination the psychological domination. You guys, give me a second. <laughs> give me a second.
Yeah, I was about to eat some cereal in this video. I say, you know what? I'm not gonna torture these guys like that. I'm not gonna torture y'all like that. But it was, it was about the psychological domination. It was about the control, the power exchange. Right? It's like, damn, something smells good. It's like somebody making coffee. I don't even drink coffee. I just got the smell of it. What did I do with this lighter? But it's like he got it, yo. He knew that I wanted to be dominated psychologically. And it's just like when it comes to psychological domination. Now you guys read the story. I'll give you guys a, a couple of hints here. For those who made it this far in the video. But. It happened so. Subtly. How he. Dominated me psychologically. And this is the thing. Because I think some people. They also. Like a lot of people. A lot of people have come across my videos. People even in my profession. My colleagues, right? Um, I've had professors. I've had people I work with, you know, come across my videos. And, you know, obviously my, my videos are public, open for anyone to see. But I can tell when a person has come across my videos because they interact with me differently. And because they know that I like to be dominated they assume that means that i like to be dominated by everyone absolutely no only a person of interest that i am interested in and it has to be a man like i'm a heterosexual woman okay right i i've had women try to come on to me and be dominant don't it don't work doesn't work. I'm not attracted to women. I've had men that try to come on to me and be dominant, but they're dominant in all the wrong ways. Right? And, and they're not really even dominant. They're just being dicks and assholes. Complete turn off. Like it has to come from a genuine, compassionate, sincere place for me to even receive it as dominant. And something that I'm attracted to, something that I want. Right? This is how nuanced it is. It almost like everything has to be perfectly aligned. You can't be masquerading as such, because for a woman like myself, I'm very sensitive to those minute differences coming from men who may on a facade and pretend to be something that they're really inherently not right there's no cover up um but and just the way that he approached me the way that he approached our relationship like he handled it with such delicacy which i knew that wow, this is exactly, you know, this is exactly what I need, what my inner child desires, right? Like he, he, he related and spoke to that inner child. He met me where I was. Like I said, this takes a smart person, right? There's a lot of psychology that comes into, um, understanding being able to conceptualize these dynamics it's very sophisticated right and i think a lot of people miss the mark because they just they they don't have the knowledge right they're, they're not really properly informed some of it is intuitive right so it's like no matter how much you read or how much you're taught you just won't get it because you don't have that intuitive nature to be able to kind of understand and meet a person where they are. Um, but he knew. It's not that I had to tell him anything. 
this is an issue I run into with a lot of men because it's like they want me to teach them how to dominate. That's not... I didn't have to tell him anything. That's why he was a master. Masters, you don't teach masters. Masters come already fully equipped. Like they step on the scene already prepared. They're ready. Right? He was able to read me. I didn't have to teach him how to read me. He was just able to read me. He knew what level I was at developmentally, right? And he, he related to that. I have to say, okay, that, oh, okay, I'm a 10-year-old child today or I'm a 12-year-old, right? Or I'm a third. Like, he didn't have to ask that, right? He didn't have to say, okay, what do you like? What do you don't like? He learned along the way and... The thing that turns me off is when men be like, oh, so what do you, they be like, you know, asking me what are my interests or they'll say like, just the most annoying things. Um, and I, I feel like some things like you should be asked if you're a true dominant, right? If you're, if you're a true master, you're not afraid to take risks. Right. Or make mistakes. Right. Like you boldly, you act very courageously and you and you just take initiative and you may get it right. You may not, but you own that and you keep going. Right. I think the issue when it comes to beta men that obviously I don't like <laughs> is that they are too afraid. So they're very hesitant in that way. So they ask too many questions, right? Instead of just stepping out into the water, right? And feeling their way, right? They're just so reserved in that way, which I know they're not for me. He definitely wasn't afraid to take risks. And he set the precedent, like he set the stage for how things would go in that relationship, but very, like he was calculating since like he wasn't too um, domineering, right? Like there was some room for me to say, wait a minute, right? And set my own limits, but at the same time, like he stood firm in who he was. I'm like, God damn. Almost like a father, right? Like he, that's what they call a daddy dom. You know, it's just like you think of fathers, thinking of my own father, my biological father. It's like I was able to say no. I did say no, in fact, right? Um, my dad raised me. My dad raised me um, with my mom, too. They both raised me up until the age of 12. I went to live with my mom for four years, and then I came back and lived with my dad the remainder two years of my high school when I was 16 years old. So my dad had a chance to raise me by himself, and then I ended up moving out. I went to college. But I remember there were, like, rules that my dad was set, and I would disagree with those rules. Um, there was room for me to disagree. He didn't like it. But he still stayed, like he stayed firm on what his rules were. He did not bend. And that's one thing I saw in my master at the time is though, like he had his rules. This is what I expect. I expect you to check in at X, Y, and Z times throughout the day. Right? And of course, you know, Everyone is prone to error, right? Um, can't control time or things that happen in time, right? And so there were times where I would miss that check-in time. And he made it clear from the jump, like, this is what I expect. This is, this will be the consequences, Right. And we agree on that. Right. Of course, he got my consent in the matter. But that's the shit that was so attractive because he wasn't like, OK, does that work for you? 
he was like, no, this is how things are going to be. And he wasn't fake in a sense. Like, I've come across men who try, like, they, you can tell they're trying. They're trying ever so hard to be firm and set those limits and set those rules, expectations, but, <laughs> like, they can't back it up, right? It's almost just like a weak parent that, you know, they, they want to be firm with their child, but the child can see, like, you don't even believe that shit. <laughs> right and when children can look up to their parents and say, like you don't even believe that shit yourself so how are you gonna tell me how are you gonna set this boundary with me but you don't even really truly believe they can tell if you really believe what you're saying to them or if you're really gonna enforce what you're saying right and the shit just fall through the cracks essentially um but that shit to me yo was so freaking attractive because Every time, and of course, being a baby girl, like I would test limits with my master to see, like, is he really about what he say he about, or is he just, you know, saying that because it makes him feel powerful, right? So I would see, like, is he really going to enforce that? And sometimes I would pur purposefully check in late, whether it was four minutes late, five minutes late, and then he would be like. <laughs> like he would like he would straighten me out like wait a minute you know and he would get on me about it and then there were times where I would make a mistake not even on purpose but it would just be a mistake and I'm like damn you know I fucked up but at the same time like he would remind me like this is what you agreed to so either you know you're going to stick to this agreement. Do you really want to do this? And I like that he held me accountable in that. And through it all, like, I can see myself maturing through this whole process, right? So I think that's the beauty in it because it's like, yes, there is this dynamic that is co-created between myself as a baby girl, you know, and my partner being the daddy dom. And this this dynamic serves a purpose. There's a function to this this power exchange, you know. And it's like I'm being molded to become this person that works for not only him but works for myself. And oh my gosh, it, it just works, right? And so I since that relationship. Because um, that was back in 2014. But since that relationship, and, I, and it didn't work out, and I've said the reason why before, but I'll say it here. It didn't work out because, you know, I learned that he was married. And it was just a fucking bummer. I was like, oh my gosh, you would be fucking married. Um, but it wasn't revealed, and that's something that he kind of kept hidden. But when I questioned him about it, because I saw. I saw the imprint on his finger from the ring. I'm just like, you're married? And so granted that relationship, though it progressed very rapidly, you know, it was short lived. Um, so it just didn't work. But since I have definitely met a few men who identify as dog, um, daddy dom some were like hyper focused on sex you know and which i think that just takes away from that dynamic um because sex is gonna be there like you will get sex you know but i just feel like you're not gonna get sex right if i can see that that's what's driving you to this type of relationship or in this type of relationship and so when it comes to the discipline aspect of it and the the beatings that obviously play a role and going back to the my master relationship right or the relationship i have my master like he definitely implemented discipline and that shit was real discipline yo i was just like god damn uh it was some straightening but it was just like i loved it in fact, I love it so much, I craved it. And I think behaviorally, um, I, in a sense, was conditioning him, right? Because 
I would act out more just to get disciplined and that's not really what he wanted but partially it was what he wanted because he also got reinforced for the things that he wanted it's part of that too um even though we didn't have intercourse you know he got off on disciplining me so it was a reinforcer for him um I think for people, adult people, um, obviously, you know, there's this socialization in our society that sets these rules, expectations on what a woman, what a man is supposed to look like and how that dynamic is supposed to manifest itself interpersonally. Um, so that obviously interferes with people like myself being able to, you know, have these types of relationships with people because there's, it's so stigmatized and there's, you know, taboos surrounding it. Um, but for me, like, I know, you know, where that's coming from. I know that for me, it's just who I am is who I'm always going to be. You know, I talked about me going to therapy as part of my, um, fulfillment for my doctoral degree back in Los Angeles and I hired a psychoanalyst who tried to therapize me <laughs> he tried to heal me and reverse you know this desire of mine to be dominated and I talk about how although that will never be reversed um, I'm always going to crave that that energy of a dominant man you know and, and I, I love the power exchange that exists when i'm in that that type of relationship um but what it did do what that therapy relationship did do was gave me a greater appreciation for it and valuing it as a, a treasured gift right so much that i just don't you know i'm, I'm not swindled right i don't fall for these perpetrators or men who pose as a dom, but really they're not, you know? Um, yeah, I think that dominant men are very rare, a rare commodity. It's just, it is what it is. You guys feel free to share your thoughts below. Um, and another issue is that it can get to the point where it's a thin line. Let's be honest, it's a thin line between um, dominance and abuse. <laughs> you know, let's just let's just call it as it is. And I think you know we're all human beings, right? We're all prone to error, and for some naturally dominant men, they fall victim to that they're not planning it to happen they're, they're not expecting that to happen that's not their intentions but and having so much power is almost similar to the idea of you know cult leaders it's like they set out most of them anyway not all but most cult leaders kind of set out with good intentions on influencing a group of people, right? And creating this uniformity amongst their group under certain principles that usually are positive, right? And well-intentioned. But then over time, seeing how they're able to galvanize so much power and influence over the members who join this, this group, this organization, like that power... And then comes at their own detriment, you know, and they become self-sabotaging, right? Like it starts to eat them up and that happens, I think, with this power exchange between a submissive and a dominant man. You know, I've, I've experienced that, not even that I've seen it, but I've experienced it personally for myself which speaks to my last relationship that I had, my last serious long-term relationship. 
um, there were some things that transpired in that relationship that obviously I didn't see coming. He definitely didn't see coming. Um, but it happened because that power is like almost hypnotizing in a way. And it's, 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 like it consumes a person, you know, and of course it's, it's that power exchange is co-created, you know, so it's not to point fingers at any one person to say, oh, well, the person who holds the power, so to speak, is the person that is responsible because who gave that person that power? I, I did. So, you know, one can ask the question, who really holds the power, <laughs> Right. Is it the dom or is it the submissive baby girl? If she's the one giving that power away, if you give something to a person, you can easily take it back, right? Is it true power then that they possess? <laughs> hmm. Is it true power? If it's given to a person, do they really own that power? I would say it's a combination because, you know, some of that power is given, but some of it is just taken. And that's the art to it. Um, especially in the beginning phase, I would say, yes, of course, I definitely gave a lot of power up. But then I think some of it was just snatched away from me through this whole process of giving it like it was just taken readily because I was giving right <laughs> like it has to be a receiver on the other side of that that gift and in having all of this power I can't imagine what it's like, you know, I get that some guys, some of you guys who watch my videos, you know, ask the question like, would you, you know, be a, a slave owner or, you know, would you have slaves? Would you, you know, be in that position where you're the dominant person? I can only imagine what it's like. I don't think I want to be that person. I don't I have no interest for well, the reason being, I think it, it, it takes is like it takes a lot of responsibility. It requires that I hold much more responsibility than what I think I will want to. And I can easily see where that power that is given to me can be easily corrupted. Um, I don't think I want, I don't want that. And of course, one can make the argument to say, oh, well, no, you know, if you're careful, right, and you're self-aware, you can make sure that you don't become this corrupted individual with all this power over the people that you own. But I'm like, even that dynamic, I'm not turned on by that. I still would ask the question, what's in it for me? What do I gain from having, I don't gain anything because... Those slaves can't fulfill what my needs are. <laughs> this is why it's important to get to know what a person, like you, you are trying to create something with a person. It's important to not assume that you know what they want and what's best for them. Because what you're trying to give them, they might not even want <laughs> or need for that matter. And there's nothing that a slave or a submissive has that I want, right? They cannot meet my needs, but a dominant man can. A true dominant man can definitely meet my needs. Um, yeah. You guys feel free to share this video. I think it's unique though because it's like knowing that I possess this gift of submission, very valuable or invaluable gift. Like I get to choose who I want to share this gift with. 
And unfortunately, I have not found a man worthy. I have, yo, I have a lot of men approach me, right? And I think there's this myth. I'm going to talk about this probably in one of my next videos that somehow people have been swindled into believing that women are at a misfortune and men disproportionately outnumber women in terms of dating options like that could not be any further away from the freaking truth i'm like how when i have so many men in my inbox right this whole freaking myth that men outnumber women and for every woman or for every man there's like eight to ten women and all that like how is that even so when I have so many men, countless men, in my inbox trying to holler at me? Not just in my inbox, but in real life, face to face, in the streets, I'm approached. I, I go based off of energy, and if I'm not feeling you in that way, or if I'm just, just in my own state, not ready emotionally to receive anything a man has to offer then you know i remain single um i have to be very convinced that okay it's worth my time because i understand that we live in a culture that people aren't really serious you know there's this whole throwaway culture and there's a lot of people just wasting time so knowing that I am very particular about who I give my time to and I've turned down countless number of men or just pulled my energy away from their interests. And I think the space I'm in is a very safe space and being single, I choose to be single, understand that. <laughs> I even shared like this um, meme recently about how, you know, when you see a single woman, no, like that's a choice. You know, women have a hard time finding a man. No woman. All this dick running around here and all these men willing to just give themselves away to a woman. A woman never has a hard time finding a, a partner, a sex partner or any kind of partner for that matter. It's just, you know, finding the right one. And a woman in and of herself being ready to to mate, to, to give herself, right? To allow a man to enter into her space. Like, you have to be in a position where you are ready to receive that. Uh, and for me, I think I have my moments. It's like, I have my moments, which this is very like a small window. And I felt that, honestly, yo, I felt that moment recently... In the past week, I will say that much. I'm just like, oh, my heart was softened. And I was open and I was receptive. And it, it just comes very sparingly, though. It's not like a regular thing where I'm feeling this way um, about receiving. But, yeah, I did feel that way, like, in the past week. And I'm just like, I was, like, surprised at myself. Um, my heart was softened, um, but then I was reminded, like, okay, yeah, this is the reason why, I, you know, okay. this is the reason why I can't, I just, just don't I have the freaking patience and tolerance for this shit, I just, <laughs> I have to remind myself, like, okay, this is the reason why, yo, um, well, you guys, feel free to show your comments below, what do you guys think, for those watching, I think I need to reset my algorithm because I realize in making so many videos relating to cup holding, like I have attracted a lot of more people than what I want to attract that I feel have nothing to do with really my interests. You know, clearly I'm interested in BDSM and I've attracted a bunch of white beta cup hold men. And while it might be exciting talking about that, and I've said this before, like, okay, I need to just 
cut off those emails. I received so many emails and I'm open to addressing you guys' questions and concerns. But honestly, I think I'm going to cut it off. You know, I feel like, okay, it was fun while it lasted, but this is not a cuckold channel. And I don't have an interest in cuckolding. And I've attracted so many viewers that, <laughs> you know, I'm like, why? You know, what does this benefit me? It doesn't. Um, of course, I have videos, obviously, that go on viral from that topic because it's just a viral topic. But, I'm like, mm. I want to attract different people. I Honestly, you know what I want to see on my channel more? I want to see more black men, even black women, but definitely more black men, more dominant men, all right? All these beta men, y'all got to go. Maybe y'all can, maybe, okay, maybe y'all can stay. You can watch from the sidelines, right? But yeah, I definitely want to attract more, more alpha men, dominant men on my channel, because I like to see the different perspectives and... I think I'm just annoyed. That's what it is. I'm annoyed by a lot of y'all cuckold men, beta, white. Y'all just annoy me. I made a video. This was like maybe, what, two weeks ago where I addressed an email that I received in response to a topic, a video that I made, and I don't even remember. This is like how, how focused I am, you know, when it comes to, first of all, my career, right? Y'all, y'all forget that. I am a psychologist full time. I do this just for fun when I make videos. So that obviously my career takes priority. Y'all forget that that I may make a video about something, but days later, I mean that video is done, right? Like I made the video, I said what I had to say, y'all watch it whenever you watch it, but my mind is no longer there. So I'm over it. I'm not even thinking about that, but you know, y'all come across my video and then y'all still talking about it. And I'm just like, I'm completely over that. Um, but yeah, it's just like, you know, I've, from the videos that I've made, I've attracted like these white men who are very insecure. Some of y'all, a lot of y'all have like low self-esteem and it's just giving me like low vibrational vibes, you know? And some of y'all have expressed opposition to things I've said or to me. I can care less, really. Y'all should know. Like, I'm solidified in who I am as a black Pan-African woman. That's not going to change, you know. But it's just annoying, if anything. That's what it is. It's just, eh. It's like, why are you here? Like, <laughs> like get away. You know, like, it's just annoying pests, right? That annoys, like get away kind of thing so um that's kind of where I'm at some of y'all are you know if you're not like on that extreme of being uh repulsive and demeaning and disrespectful like you know sometimes y'all are annoying or you just you're insecure you have low self-esteem and that to me also is repulsive and yeah, it's just low vibrational. It's just kind of not the energy that I want on my page. Um, yeah, you know, and you know, you guys just, you, you listen, you, you request videos that I make where you want me to talk about things and share my opinion. And then you just like, you don't like what I say, you may misinterpret some things I say, and you know, you're dealing with your own unhealed childhood traumas, so then I say things that trigger you, sometimes intentionally, and then it's just like this, you want to create like this enactment, this back and forth kind of thing that I'm not really interested in at all. I just not. I don't. I don't go back and forth with people, right? And but you want to engage me, so you're like blowing up my inbox, steadily trying to get me to respond. I end up having to block you, and like, it's just annoying to me. It, you know, it's annoying. It's distracting. So going forward, I'm definitely considering kind of changing the algorithm here in my channel. 
And obviously that would relate to me changing what I talk about and ignoring a lot of y'all emails, you know, because my videos are, they may start off slow, right? With a low number of views, but then somehow they just skyrocket. That's just how my videos do. It's just like, what the hell? I find it be weird as hell. Because usually um, when you see viral videos, it's the other way around where, you know, initially when they're posted, the traction takes off. But my videos are the complete opposite. It's just like slow to warm for some reason. And then out of nowhere, boom, skyrocket. And then I have like thousands and thousands of fucking views on my, my video. Um, so then you guys like are watching my videos way after it's posted, way after, you know, the topic is of relevance, I would say. Um, and then you come later and you comment and you email me and I'm just like, Ugh. so yeah, I think I'm over it. I'm over talking about that topic. Um. Because it's just, yeah, it's played out. I've said this before. Like, I saw this in, like, other videos that I made, like, over a year ago or a couple years ago. Like, just over talking about cuckolding and somehow you guys find a way to reel me back in <laughs> to talk about it even more. Um, and so that's that. But... I would say, was saying that, like, I want to attract people, more people within the BDSM community. Um, when I say BDSM, obviously that is the DS S&M lifestyle, you know. And when I say that, I mean in the traditional sense where the man is the head, right? The man holds the power. I want to attract more of that. I know you guys are out there. Some of y'all have come across my videos. You found my my channel. Um, but it's like few far in between. Right? And yeah, I would love, I definitely would welcome that more dominant men, even women, submissive women too, um, to comment my videos, you guys can reach out and email me and feel free to share topic ideas as it relates to BDSM. In fact, in my next video, I might just do an open call, an invitation for you guys to provide uh, topic, video topic suggestions on things that we can talk about moving forward as it relates to BDSM. And not the coding, another two hours, somewhat related, but yeah, I want to switch gears a little bit. Having said that, I'm about to end this video and figure out what I'm going to eat tonight. I feel like I've ate like everything possible except for sushi. I don't really like sushi, but I'm surrounded by a bunch of fucking sushi restaurants. Um, and this is like the downside in living in a predominantly white neighborhood because their taste buds are just completely off kilter. Like they're just completely different from what. I like <laughs> what I'm used to. Um, so I don't know what I'm going to eat tonight. We just have a bowl of cereal. Call it night. But I don't know. I'll catch you guys later. Thumbs up this video. I've been saying that lately and you guys have been listening as I noticed. I love it. I love it. I feel like there's something else I wanted to share here in this video. But it's not coming to me quite. Maybe I'll do a part two. Then I'll catch y'all later.